Hello everyone, let me welcome you yet to yet another session of this NPTEL course titled The History of English Language and Literature. In today's session where we continue to discuss the Romantic Age, we move away from poetry towards the prose writings of this period. Though the most characteristic genre of this period was poetry, it was not wanting in prose literature. We do find that there was incredible kind of uh, uh, output being made in the form of prose writings as well. Uh, though in comparison to the poetry it does uh, fade a little uh, into oblivion, we do notice that this was the age which also laid the foundation of a new kind of writing, particularly a more prosaic form of essay writing which originated in the 18th century and then culminated with the 19th century romanticism. So in general, apart from many other kinds of uh, prose writings which were being made available from the 18th century onwards, we begin to notice that uh, the most fundamental influence was in the form of essay writing and we also find an inaugural moment being witnessed in the case of uh, uh, reviews and magazines which began to flourish from the 19th century onwards. So some prominent reviews were quite fundamental in laying the foundations of uh, proper essay writing in English uh, literature and in that sense we begin to notice that in 1802 the Edinburgh Review was established and the major writers who contributed to this periodical uh, were Geoffrey, Brougham, Sidney Smith and many other writers who were also prominent members of the Whig party. In 1809, the quarterly was established as a Tory counterblast and we also noticed that this was also a forum where these varying supporters of the party members used to articulate their uh, political opinions and also engage in a lot of debates and discussions. So apart from this, this was also a fertile ground for discussing the latest trends in terms of writing, in terms of uh, uh, the socio-political affairs and also the cultural and uh, the changing tastes even in terms of uh, fashion and other kinds of related things which were of uh, prominence and importance not just in England but also in the rest of Europe. The first editor of the quarterly was William Gifford and he was succeeded by Walter Scott's son-in-law Lockhart in 1824. So we also see that unlike the 17th and the 18th centuries, people began to uh, affiliate themselves to particular kinds of periodicals and particular party affiliations and that also became a kind of an identity uh, in addition to their own uh, personality. And another significant periodical was uh, Blackwood's uh, Edinburgh Magazine. This was a Tory monthly which was launched in 1870 and the major contributors included uh, Wilson, Lockhart and Hogg. The London magazine emerged as a rival to Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine and the major contributors were uh, perhaps the most famous prose writers of the 19th century as well. Uh, they were Lamb, Hazlitt, De Quincey and some of these writers such as De Quincey they contributed to uh, both these uh, rival magazines and in that sense they were affiliated to both the parties in uh, very different ways. And the other major writers of the London magazine included included Tom Hood, Alan Cunningham and Carlyle and there was also this periodical title Phrases founded in 1830 which did not have a very long lasting influence like the uh, Edinburgh magazines and the London magazines. So these magazines were very popular during that time, they were uh, immense readership and it was also enjoyed across uh, classes and it also gave a, a certain sense of what was going on in the London literary circles and also in the London political and socio-cultural uh, circles during those times. So even today these uh, continue to be a source of uh, much historical historical interest and also a source through which we can get biographical and also certain other uh, trivial information about the authors of the 19th century. The emergence of these uh, periodicals, they served a very different purpose as well. They were a great encouragement to essay writing and accordingly we find that in the 19th century most of these prose writers, they were mostly essays rather than the makers of books. We do find them focusing on uh, individual uh, pieces and also and later compiling them into a collection or, an, or a volume which uh, included most of their uh, smaller pieces of writing. And this also provided a fresh field for criticism which had begun to emerge from the 18th century onwards. And uh, here we begin to see that uh, criticism of contemporary literature was beginning to be uh, made available through most of these reviews. This also contributed to a fresh growth and a more informed kind of uh, criticism in the field of literature. In terms of criticism, it was a very different approach altogether. We find that most of these writers engaged in the discussion of respective principles and merits of the old school and the new. In that sense, we also find a way in which the, uh, the readers and the audience could also engage with a kind of a comparison between the writers of the past and also with the uh, contemporary writers. In that sense, we can also say that these uh, critics majorly belong to two different groups. One set belonged to the conservative or the classical side and the other set supported the radical or the romantic uh, kind of writing. 
So, we also begin to notice that these stark differences laid a foundational pathway for criticism to proceed from the 19th century onwards and also this is perhaps the first time when uh, writers and critics began to take sides which were not merely socio-cultural or political but were also uh, had something to do with the kind of uh, writing, the kind of poetry, the kind of uh, uh, the, the themes that they engaged with. So, in that sense we also uh, notice a certain kind of an emergence and an affiliation to particular schools of writing and also critics uh, uh, playing an influential role in either promoting or even completely destroying the literary reputation of particular writers. The prose writings which were made available in the Romantic period, they were quite different from that the Augustan prose uh, writings and though uh, the periodicals and the essay form of writing, they did emerge from the 18th century onwards. We are noted in one of the earlier sessions how their popularity had played a significant role in the transformation of literary writings altogether. Uh, however, these uh, the writings which were avail available in the Romantic period, they departed uh, severely from the uh, from the uh, themes and treatments of the 18th century. In the 18th century prose writings, though they played an inaugural role, they were found to be wanting in variety, warmth, colour and passion. So, this was the gap that uh, the Romantics began to address, though rather unselfconsciously at the beginning. So, they began to discard the 18th century tradition and also sought richer harmonies and greater complexity of structure in their prose style. And this also meant that some of them were interested in reviving the pre-Augustan uh, form of writing which were uh, more romantic in nature than the Augustan uh, period. So, uh, so, gradually we find a tendency towards romanticism not just in poetry but also in the prose writings of the period. The major writers of this period can be classified into three different groups. The first set was associated with the two great Edinburgh periodicals. The second set of writers were known as the London men and they were mostly journalists and uh, the writers who engaged in miscellaneous uh, form of uh, uh, different kinds of genres. And the third set of writers did not show any particular affiliation. They used to write for either of the political party or uh, some of them even showed romantic and classical tendencies as this at the same time. So, loosely these set of authors could be classified as the London men and the Edinburgh men and also certain uh, people who used to shift between their uh, choices and their loyalties. Among the Edinburgh men, the chief and the most important one was Francis Jeffrey who lived from 1773 to 1850. For his uh, ardent supporters, he was known as the arch critic and the others had uh, nicknamed him as the notorious Judge Jeffrey. And this was a reference to the bloody judge who lived in the 17th century in Europe. And uh, he had composed over 200 articles uh, to the Edinburgh magazine and he was considered as the most influential critic of his time. It was said that he could make or break anyone's literary career in the 19th century. And he also represented the conservative side in criticism and he was not very kind to the ones who were trying to experiment with newer forms of uh, romantic uh, writings and he was not very appreciative of the quality of imagination which was dominating the major writers of the 19th century. There was however a balance that he always could achieve in his uh, form of criticism. Uh, in the sense that he was never consistently opposed to the romantic movement nor was he a blind supporter of the Augustan tradition. But however, regardless of this uh, kind of balance that he seems to achieve in his writings, his uh, work was largely unsatisfactory. Nobody was ever satisfied with the kind of criticism that he was uh, giving. It also, in, in hindsight, we also noticed that it lacked a breadth of sympathy and also flexibility of judgment. Uh, it, it, the, the major criticism against his uh, uh, criticism was that his object was not to interpret but to arraign and if possible to condemn. So, we notice that in, uh, without uh, any kind of constructive and informed criticism, it is very difficult for uh, literature to emerge. So, in that sense, we find Jeffrey's criticism severely lacking and not uh, contributing to the progress or the uh, advent of any good kind of literature. And he also uh, being a conservative, he failed to display any feelings for the larger aspects of literature. We find him entirely disconnected from the other non-literary features which also influence writings. In that sense, he was a very uh, narrow in terms of perspective and we do find his overall critical, uh, critical uh, faculty lacking in that sense. The second important figure, Sidney Smith who lived from 1717 to 1845 was also a very uh, uh, good ally of Jeffrey. He was considered as a chief uh, co-editor to Jeffrey. He was an exceedingly clever clergyman and this was also a rare combination. We do notice that some of the writers of this period, they did engage in very uh, diverse kind of pro professions uh, such as this. 
and he was known more uh, for his witticisms and his witty remarks than for the actual uh, writings that he produced. He is said to have contributed about 65 articles to Edinburgh in that sense he was a very well known figure in London and Edinburgh during that time. His most important work however was the work which was uh, published in 1807 titled Peter Plimley's Letters. It was a brilliant satire on the Irish question. If you remember, this was uh, uh, an issue that was troubling the English government for quite a long time. We do find Smith engaging uh, satirically with this question and also enjoying a wide reputation for the publication of this. But however, his disadvantage was that uh, Smith wrote mostly for the uh, contemporary times and uh, he also has the dis disadvantage of having dealt mostly with dead abuses and forgotten controversies. Because of that, it fails to make much sense to the contemporary readers and he is not uh, really enjoyed uh, in, in, in today's terms. Among the Blackwood's men, the most important one was John Wilson, who lived from 1785 till 1854. He also had a pen name under which he wrote Christopher North. He was a wrestler and a boxer, yet another uh, very rare combination for a writer. And he was also a professor of moral philosophy in the University of Edinburgh. With this uh, very influential position, he tried to bring in high spirits and energy in everything that he wrote. And his uh, literary output was enormous. He uh, has written stories, poems, magazine articles on a variety of subjects. And his prose style in general was more inclined towards romanticism. His most significant work was a title, Noctis Ambrosia translated as Knights at the Ambrose Tavern in Edinburgh. It ran into about 70 numbers and it was hugely enjoyed during that time. This was written in the form of dialogues and it also had a lot of conviviality. It had reckless humour built into it and it was also a dashing criticism of literature and politics. So it was much enjoyed in terms of uh, contemporary interest. And, um, but the same thing became a huge disadvantage for him in the posterity because, uh, because of the local and contemporary interest in which it was much rooted in. It was very difficult for the southern reader even during those times to appreciate much of the humour in it and much of the uh, content in it. And uh, because of the broad uh, scotch element built into it, it also failed to make sense to the uh, later readers. As we noted at the outset, there were a group of writers who wrote for all these different magazines at irrespective of the kind of political affiliations that they held. And among them, the most important one was Thomas De Quincey who lived from 1785 till 1859. He was essentially a magazinist and he could compile 17 volumes of his enormous work at a later point. He wrote for the London magazine and for uh, the Blackfoots, so in that sense he, was all, he, was, uh, he also served as a common factor for both of these rival magazines. His work was not free from glaring defects. He abused his extraordinary learning in multiple ways through his expressions and often it was found that he sank into obscurity and pedantry and uh, he also got caught up in trivial arguments which, may, which did not make much sense and his writing also included a lot of long winding digressions which uh, took him away from the main point and also robbed his writings of the brevity and also the uh, clarity. Nevertheless, we find that his work was quite rich and rhetorical in style and he is also considered as one of the chief masters of romantic impassioned prose. His work in that sense, uh, keeping in tune with the romantic spirit, also had a lot of narrative and descriptive power, which made his uh, some of his writings hugely popular for the readers of those times and as well as for the readers of the posterity. His most uh, important works include John of Arc, English Male Coach and Dream uh, Fugue. But however, uh, the work which brought him much fame during his lifetime was Murder Considered as one of the fine arts in which he combined grim humour with the horrible. And he is now best known for his fascinating autobiography titled Confessions of an English Opium Eater. This continues to uh, hold much popular attention even in the contemporary. Alongside De Quincey, John Gibson Lockhart also served as a connecting link between Edinburgh and London. He lived from 1794 till 1854. He worked with Blackwood and Quarterly and also contributed heavily to both these uh, rival magazines. He also served as the editor of the Quarterly from 1826 onwards. His work was mostly of miscellaneous nature. He uh, produced a lot of essays and a lot of uh, works uh, from different genres including four novels. His uh, most noted novel uh, work was Adam Blair and he also published a collection known as Spanish Ballads and also The Life of Burns and Life of Scott. Life of Burns and Life of Scott was much appreciated during those times. It also gave uh, much insight into these um, well-known poets of uh, those times. Lockhart incidentally also married uh, Scott's daughter uh, Sophia in 1820 
and in terms of his general sympathies and in his general uh, treatment of his uh, prose works, it is said that he was romantic with Scott and sympathized with Wordsworth. But the work of the younger generation of Shelley, Keats and Tennyson at the outset of his career aroused his hostility. And this hostility was uh, also found expression in many of his criticisms. He is uh, now uh, well known for this infamous Blackwood attack on Keats uh, uh, in which he uh, identified Keats as uh, one of the members of the Cockney School of Poetry which was also a parody of the Lake School of Poets. And he wrote about Keats which also drew much flack during those times and also in the later decades and centuries. It is better and a wiser thing to be a starved apothecary than a starved poet. So back to the shop Mr. John. So this was a very derogatory comment that he made about Keats uh, poetry because he was extremely unhappy with the, uh, the kind of overflow of romanticism and he in that sense also was a supporter of the early kind of uh, romanticism and also in a certain way he encouraged the kind of uh, uh, classism which was uh, found in some ways even in the 19th century. He also launched a severe criticism of Tennyson's 1833 volume when he wrote in the quarterly and because of these scathing attacks and because of these infamous remarks he was also nicknamed the scorpion. Uh, but however, we need not forget that he could use his gift of sarcasm with a deadly effect which made him hugely unpopular during his lifetime. But his wit and his uh, sarcasm continues to be a lot of interest even to the contemporary reader. When we talk about the writers who are classified as the London men, there are three major important uh, names that come to our mind. Charles Lamb, William Hazlitt and Leigh Hunt. Charles Lamb who lived from 1775 till 1834 is best known for his work Essays of Elia. He uh, in his works it, he, it said that he was more like an uh, egotist just as Montaigne the father of the essays uh, was and uh, Lamb also in that sense draws mostly from uh, his own uh, life, his experiences and he talks about his reminiscences, his likes, dislikes, whims and prejudices. So he wrote a very personal kind of uh, essay in the 19th century and there is also this term lambish which was coined to suggest the qualities of his writings and also it serves as an epithet to talk about a very personal form of essay writing. His romanticism was again uh, still different from the romanticism that the others practiced. It was more retrospective in character and largely nourished itself on the literature of the pre-Augustan age. So we did not find him allying himself with the other dominant writers of this period but rather he goes back in time to draw inspiration. His sympathies with this early form of writing, the early uh, pre-Augustan literature, it even led to him composing uh, an Elizabethan tragedy titled John Woodville. He also uh, wrote uh, tales from Shakespeare in collaboration with Mary Lamb, his sister. So we find him uh, reviving an interest in the pre-Augustan period and also focusing much on the Elizabethan times. And uh, we find him even coming up with a, a very interesting compilation, specimens of English dramatic poets who wrote about the time of Shakespeare. This is also a source of much knowledge for older English uh, playwrights. Uh, so in that accordingly Lamb remarks about his own writing that he wrote neither for the present nor for the future but for antiquity. In spite of this fervent interest in the pre-Augustan period, he maintained very close relationships and close contacts with the contemporaries such as Burton, Fuller and Sir Thomas Brown. He was also considered as, as quite a good acquaintance of uh, Coleridge who addressed uh, his poem this Lime Tree Bower, My Prison. Uh, to Lamb himself. Addressing the influence that Charles Lamb had in, in the prose writers of the 19th century, it said that Lamb's memory will retain its uh, fragrance as long as the best spice extended on the pharaohs. This was a comment made by Rob Robert Sade, one of his contemporaries and we also find him continuing to be one of the most celebrated prose writers from the 19th century and his essays are still of much interest. They are even taught across different universities even today. William Hazlitt who lived from 1778 till 1830 was Lamb's contemporary. He was considered as the best equipped and the most satisfactory critic of his day. And it said that he could do justice to the Romantic school without being unjust to the to the Augustans. And this was considered as a very rare feat to achieve and he did just that. And some of his important works include characters of Shakespeare's plays, the English poets, the English comic writers and the dramatic literature of the age of Elizabeth. Because of his profound influence and the prolific output of his uh, critical energy, he was considered as the critic's uh, critic. But uh, however, there were also limitations to his uh, to the criticism that he practiced. This could be attributed more to the age that he is he was part of than to the than to his own poetic uh, genius. 
Uh, it said that he uh, did not uh, make any attempt to rise above the critic's personal judgment. He could not also effectively connect the author with, with the life and spirit of the age. In that sense, and in the overall scheme of things, we find that his interpretation lacked uh, in a very large historical way because he could not really see the continuity or the connections. This limitation is attributed largely to the many things which were wanting in criticism in general in the 19th century because it was still at a stage of infancy in many ways. Hazlitt was more considered more as a contemporary in, in terms of his prose style of writing. Uh, if I could read to you an excerpt from one of his essays on the feeling of immortality in youth published in 1850. Here it goes, no young man believes he shall ever die. It was a saying of my brothers and a fine one. There is a feeling of eternity in youth which makes amends for everything. To be young is to be as one of the immortal gods. One half of time is indeed flown. The other half remains in store for us with all its countless treasures. For there is no line drawn and we see no limit to our hopes and wishes we make the coming age our own. In terms of language, he also began to notice that the 19th century prose uh, style in English uh, literature was closer to what we now uh, recognize as the modern English and it was uh, freer from uh, cliched uh, forms of expressions. It was also closer to the language of uh, the common man. And uh, in that sense, here we find a very supreme example of the, in that sense, we also find a very supreme example of the romantic school's influence in the evolution of uh, English language in the 19th century. Lehunt was another uh, one who was considered as one of the London men. He was a poet and a prose writer at, at the same time he was also one of those very few who was forced to live by his pen. So accordingly there is a lot of hasty work that he had to produce but he was also very well known for his quick wit and abundant fancy which also classifies him as one of the most important romantic writers. However in terms of his criticism he is ranked away below Hazlitt and Lack. It is said that he did not have that kind of critical genius to compete with either Hazlitt or with Lamb. He had an eclectic taste and he also showed a very heavy tendency towards romanticism. His most important work is titled Autobiography. This is considered as a pious and ingenious and altogether human and worthy book by Carlyle. There were also other prose writers of uh, notable uh, merit during this period. The important ones being William Cobbett who authored Rural Rights and English Grammar. These were considered as very entertaining works in the 19th century. And Hazlitt, one of the foremost leading critics of the time, he regarded uh, Cobbett as one of the best and equated him along with uh, Bunyan, Defoe and Swift. Uh, Lander was a writer who exhibited an antithesis to Cobbett. His imaginary conversation which ran into about 150 in, in number, it engages with the dialogues between great characters of the past. Many of uh, Lander's work in fact uh, follows the same structure and the same inspiration. Uh, we find him authoring the citation of William Shakespeare, uh, Pericles and Aspasia which was more like a discussion of the golden age of uh, Athens narrated through letters and uh, Pentameron, it was the dialogue between Petrarch and Boccaccio. So we find all of these writers experimenting in many different ways and articulating the spirit of romanticism through various genres and also through various forms of imaginary expressions. Robert Sade, the poet whom we have already taken a look at, he was an industrious prose writer as well and his uh, uh, supreme uh, masterpiece in terms of prose writings was uh, the life of Nelson. Coleridge's uh, prose was considered as fragmentary as his verse and his criticism though it was uh, suggestive and uh, stimulating and also uh, made a profound influence in the establishment of the romantic principle in literature. It was in general considered as a uh, written in a very uh, poor and rambling style. So his biography a literaria though it gave a high standing for him among the English writers on the theory of poetry his style was not appreciated. So because of that Biographia Literaria failed to reach to the level of lyrical ballads which was uh, very profoundly authored by uh, Wordsworth. In addition to all these writers that we have now discussed, there were also many writers in history and philosophy who continued to dominate the 19th century scene. But however, the literary historians in general do not consider them as valuable contributions to the prose writings of this period and hence refrain from including them in the many discussions which are part of literary history. Having gone through an array of writers who contributed to the prose writings of the 19th century, we have also noticed that just like the poets of this period was quite uh, different and individual in their uh, passion and in their contribution, we find that the prose writers also exhibited a certain sense of individuality which also makes it difficult for us to find common elements which connected them. They uh, used to take inspiration uh, from the contemporary times, from the classical times and even from the Augustan and the pre-Augustan times. So in that sense, there is a varied kind of uh, 
uh, raw materials that they draw from and also their inspiration is quite eclectic and sometimes even esoteric in nature. This in fact highlights the individual nature of all of these contributions and it also makes uh, the romantic period all the more interesting, radical and revolutionary. So with this we wrap up today's lecture. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.